Hey everybody, welcome to the show. So we're going to get things going in just a minute uh, with my full Raw review that took place last night, April 20th, 2020, in the Performance Center in Orlando, Florida, where else, and giving you guys my thoughts on Drew McIntyre and his six or seven or eight Claymore kicks that he delivered on Monday night, as well as Seth Rollins' response and why Drew McIntyre is rewarding the behavior of Seth Rollins, as well as Zelina Vega's big night for the second week in a row, and Angel Garza, Andrade, and Austin Theory being really the sacrificial lambs for Drew McIntyre. So I'm going to get to that, as well as Shayna Baszler, who seems to be back on track. And we're going to touch on the rumors of The Rock versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 37. So we're going to get it all started right now. Welcome to the WWE Podcast, the most passionate and authentic wrestling analysis on the web. We've got you covered with every Raw, SmackDown, and NXT show, giving you a no-bullshit opinion. We know you love wrestling. We do, too. So let's get this show underway. And that's the bottom line. What? Because Stone Cold said so. Hey guys, welcome to the WWE Podcast on this Tuesday, April 21st, 2020. And a lot to talk about tonight. A lot to get to with Monday Night Raw that I thought was a very good show in general. Felt very similar to last week. I don't know if you guys felt that same way. There were a lot of similarities from last week. It was almost a recycled show that was uh, kind of a refresh and we certainly saw some things that progressed, but it wasn't a blockbuster night by any means. It was kind of a maintenance show that was solid. It was a safe show, if that makes sense. And uh, it was focused on McIntyre, who uh, was just absolutely dominant. And Zelina Vega, who is just, again, I, I, you know, you guys know that if you listen to my show... I am a huge supporter, I'm a huge believer uh, in Zelina Vega and that she should be featured in prominent positions and being at the forefront of a group and being the spokesperson for a group. And that's exactly what she is right now. And um, I was and, and continue to be a huge fan of Zelina uh, and advocating for that for that position for her, not just to, to stay stagnant, but to evolve, right? I don't want her to just, you know, continue to be this, this manager that is great. I would eventually like to see her in some kind of physical role as women's champion. That ultimately is what personally I'm aiming for and looking for, for Zelina Vega. Um, I really think she could be that damn good. Uh, to steal a line from Triple H, who will be celebrating his 25th anniversary of, I don't know, being in WWE or whatever. Um, I Again, if you guys know me, you, you know that I think it's an angle. This is setting something up for Triple H versus somebody. I don't know who. Maybe Kevin Owens, who has been MIA. But the, the problem is, this is a SmackDown celebration and Kevin Owens is on Raw, so... I'm, I don't know. I don't know how they get to who they want to get to. It could be KO, but again, he's a raw guy. So we'll have to see, but it's clearly an angle for something. You know, you don't just have something like this promoted two weeks out and then end up being just a flat, no payoff with just Triple H, you know, standing in the ring, giving a speech about how great his career has been and how thankful he is for it. So this has to lead to something. So there's my quick thoughts on uh, the 25th. 25 years of Triple H celebration, whatever this is going to be. Okay, um, so guys, thank you for joining me. I hope that you subscribe and tell a friend if you like the show. If you liked it a lot, maybe you take 10 seconds out of your day and give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Or uh, just give us a, a shout-out on Twitter. I mean, it, it could be as simple as that, too. I do uh, appreciate everyone who has done that. And, and uh, really, it really does make a difference. And... I do notice it for sure. It's uh, much appreciated for those that enjoy the show. There's a lot more coming down the line. Let me just say that. The show is going nowhere. It's going to be here throughout this pandemic, throughout the next year, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years. We've got a long road ahead as this show will continue to grow. 
and it'll continue to evolve and improve, hopefully, and um, <clears throat> you guys can be a part of it. How? Just send me your voice. How do you do that? Send me a voicemail from your phone to my email at realwwepodcast at gmail.com, and you will be on the show, and uh, it can be a rant, it can be a question, it can be anything, as long as it's PG. I know that I have had some explicit shows in the past, a handful of explicit shows, but I generally like to keep it PG as I think it affords us the largest audience possible. Um, so keep it PG, but you can get your voice on the show any anytime you'd like. Many of you have taken advantage, as you've heard over the last number of shows. So I think it's a cool segment that we do where you guys get to chime in and uh, and be a part of it. So all right, well, with that out of the way, guys, uh, this week, just so you know, schedule wise, not much changing. It's going to be a uh, wrestling nostalgia tomorrow night. It may be from the vault, probably will be, but I'll dig one out that's pretty good and give you guys some some new comments up front. And then on uh, on, on Thursday and Friday will be your AEW NXT, and then Saturday or Sunday again. It kind of fluctuates depending on my schedule and my co host schedules. Um, be back for the weekend review, the big show of the week. It's kind of the big flagship show, as I like to call it. Um, and, and that's what it is. I know that there is other podcasts that call things flagship. I'm not stealing it from that. It, it truly is a flagship uh, show, is is the weekend show. If, uh, if, if you guys want to check that out, it's held every Saturday or Sunday. It's the weekend review. That's the big show for us. So check it out. And I uh, hope you guys tell a friend and uh, support the show any way that you can. It's much appreciated. And uh, just let me say this, though, with the AEW show, I know some of you are like, oh, why are you called the WWE podcast if you cover uh, AEW? Well, here's here's what I have to say about that. This is my show, so I will cover wrestling as I see fit. And if you're a wrestling fan, I don't know why anybody would be anti-AEW. It's a great alternative to WWE, and it's another place that um, men and women can go to work. And with the 30, 40, 50 releases that WWE had in their biggest release day in the history of the company, it certainly is not a bad thing that they have possibly a place to go beyond Ring of Honor, New Japan, Impact, that they can go and make a living. Because that's uh, that's ultimately the biggest part of it. So um, the reason we cover AEW, because people like AEW. There are a lot of AEW and WWE fans. I know that it's not true to the name WWE podcast. I, I mean, be honest, it's just splitting hairs. I mean, so if you like wrestling, you like it. If you don't want to listen to AEW review, then guess what? You don't. So, okay, um, let's let's move on here. Let's get to the Monday Night Raw that uh, aired last night from Orlando. And um, the, you know. I want to talk about this up front. I'm not one of those shows, number one, that goes through every segment and goes through chronologically. I will be honest. I have the Hulu version. If you know me, you guys know I have the Hulu version, which means stuff is kept out of the Hulu version. And I catch up with it in the written reviews for Raw. So if you're like, hey, you missed this or that. Well, that means that Hulu felt and WWE felt it wasn't important enough to put on the uh, 90 minute version of Raw. So. Um, I, I don't always comment on those segments. It's more of kind of like a Hulu raw review, but, um, if I see something worth mentioning, I will mention it. So I just want to put that disclaimer up front for new listeners who say he's not doing a full raw review. Well, that's cause I watch Hulu like a lot of other people. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do again, since we don't go segment by segment in some kind of chronological boring order, I want to talk about the, the, the Nia Jax. Kyrie Sane match and the, the particularly and we'll get to the match itself which I have some some things to say but the pre-match interview that uh that Charlie Caruso did with Kyrie Sane and Oscar who is just becoming my guilty pleasure now uh, again I was back and forth on whether I found her extremely annoying or kind of annoyingly charming and I have now cited on the annoyingly charming <laughs> side where I, I actually look forward to her screaming and looking like a, basically a life-size cartoon. Um, so anyway, but Kyrie Sane didn't, she didn't say a whole lot. Uh, but Charlie Caruso mentioned that why would you, uh, ask for a rematch with Nia Jax, given the height difference, the height difference. I understand Nia Jax six foot. I don't understand Kyrie Sane, five foot one. 
But the fact is, if you're in a simulated sport or, you know, you're trying to at least be somewhat realistic, height doesn't come in. There's, there, aren't, there aren't height divisions in any sport. There are weight divisions in sports. And not every sport. But the fact is, weight, i.e. size, has a much, much, much bigger effect on your opponent than does height. Height can give you leverage advantages. But weight gives you that power advantage, the strength advantage. And that's a much, much, much bigger advantage that uh, can be afforded to an opponent. And so my point is, and I tweeted this out, and I'm surprised nobody blew up at me given the the super sensitive society that we live in today. Um, I tweeted out this. Are we really that sensitive that we can't mention the word size or weight with the women's division? Charlie Caruso asks Kyrie why she would ask for a rematch given the height difference. Yes, they are almost a foot apart, but fact is weight makes much more of a difference. Well, yeah, it does. And uh, so I, I just don't understand. You pick height? I mean, can't she, she, she can't just say size of, of, of Nia Jax given the size difference. I mean, Nia Jax embraces it. She'd be the first one to tell you. But apparently... WWE views, well, we can't associate weight and women. That would be body shaming. Give me an effing break. Because you know that's exactly the reason they didn't mention the word size or God forbid weight. It's it's uh, It just was one of those moments that is just a sign of the times, it, which is really what it was to me. It was a sign of the times, of this, just the the victim mentality that so many people have and the getting offended on behalf of other people's society that we live in at times. And it's just a sign of the year and the environment we are in. And it has nothing to do with the pandemic. Now, when I say environment, I mean the culture that we live in. It's just one of those things that just, oh, it makes me, it just makes me cringe of how soft people are. And the reason WWE left that out. So don't, I mean, don't even give me the, oh, well, that wasn't on purpose. They just put a word, an adjective in there. No, 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 no. You look at Nia Jackson, you look at Kyrie saying, you put them side by side. What's the first thing you're going to think? Wow. Nia Jax is a lot bigger. You wouldn't dare say that. She's a lot bigger. Her size is much, uh, much bigger. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. There's a height difference. That's secondary. I mean, Nia Jax has probably got a good 100 pounds on Kyrie Sane. So uh, that that just irked me. Uh, it irked me when the, the culture of 2020 bleeds into this fantasy land of pro wrestling when we can't even talk about the fact that's at our fingertips and in front of our eyes that the reason that there's an advantage for, for Nia Jax is the fact that she is a bigger woman. She's bigger. She's heavier. She's got more weight. Does that seriously offend anybody? Th- these are facts. I mean, so it's, uh, anyway. Okay. But the match itself, I didn't mind. Nia Jax looked a little bit rusty at times. Um, and that's kind of been her MO where she, prior to her uh, double ACL injury, um, was kind of known for hurting girls, hurting women. Um, not on purpose. She, I just think needed a little bit more training, um, need a little bit more time. She's got, she, she probably has a little ring rust right now. And I think she's a, got a great upside. I think that she has a real shot at winning the women's money in the bank briefcase. I don't know if she'll win, but she has a shot at it. And she's in the top three, certainly the top three in discussion for realistic winners of that match. And, uh, you know, but the match itself with Kyrie last night was good. It wasn't great. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know the last time Kyrie Sane has even won a match in WWE. And with Nia Jax out there basically ragdolling her, um, it's such a, you know, it, it's, it's hard to see because Kyrie Sane is a hell of a talent. Kyrie Sane, watching her in NXT from where she to where she is now, ugh, she's one of those call ups that you go, oh, I wish she just kind of stayed in NXT. And yeah, we're going to call them call ups. Because the fact is that there are more eyeballs on Raw and SmackDown than NXT. 
I understand NXT is a legitimate third brand, but in terms of viewership, it's it is defined as a call up because you're getting called up to having more people watch you. So, um, with Kyrie saying though, you know, you see what has happened outside of the the brief success she has found with uh, with uh, Oscar winning the women's tag belts and going on a solid run and and uh, yeah, she had a good short amount of time there for a couple of months and then just kind of got lost in the sauce once Oscar went and hooked up with Becky Lynch and then. She started, uh, Kyrie Sane started losing on a weekly basis and was uh, lost last week, lost at WrestleMania, takes the pinfall in the Women's Tag Team Championship match at Mania, takes the uh, pinfall in the rematch to the uh, Women's Tag Team belts on the Monday Night Raw after Mania, loses last week, loses this week. Um, Kyrie Sane needs to turn things around. I don't know what or, or why WWE has decided to make her a glorified enhancement talent at this point. Um, I'm not. I'm not following. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she has said things. I know she's, and I can't remember where I saw this, but she has been vocal about possibly leaving a leaving for AEW or just leaving WWE um, after her contract is up. I don't know. I, again, I can't remember where I saw that. But if anybody else has heard that and can corroborate that with my brain, let me know because I'm curious where that came from. Maybe it is my own head, and if it is, that's a scary place to be. Just uh, ignore it. But I just don't know. I'm trying to figure out what the missteps that Kyrie has made. Who did she piss off, basically? I mean, it, it, who did she piss off? Kind of like when uh, you had Ricochet go from the main event of uh, of the WWE Championship facing Brock Lesnar at the uh, Super Showdown to losing to um, uh, basically another enhancement talent on Raw. I um, can't think of the name. You probably are all screaming it right now. But uh, it was a... It was. It's just a fall from grace, and I, I know Kyrie has a lot of talent, and her pairing with Asuka is good, um, but right now she is on a very noticeable, damaging losing streak. You know, the winning and losing in pro wrestling doesn't mean as much as it does in actual competitive sports. But the perception right now with Kyrie is not just oh she got she, you know she's she was doing good she had a loss she'll bounce back. It's kind of like now where you're looking at her going mm, nope she's not going to win this. Like she has been truly defined down. There's losing occasionally. There is um, losing streaks, and then there's damaging law uh, losing, and she is approaching damaging losing. Uh, so she is uh, in a dangerous place in her career. As far as the on-air perception, and it's uh, it's scary uh, because I don't I don't know where they're going with it. But so Nia Jax advances as the, everyone expected, and um, you know I I don't know if she'll win, but certainly in the conversation. And as we find out the rest of the competitors in the match, and we get closer to the pay per view, obviously we'll have a preview and prediction show. All right, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about right off the bat is the open of Raw with Drew McIntyre coming out. And not really even being mad at Seth. N- not even uh, showing a bit of anger. Almost to just an arrogance. And, and that's fine. Drew should be confident. And you know, it wasn't the level of, level of arrogance as Becky Lynch has right now, which is just an alarming level of, uh, uh, of arrogance to the point of, you know, heel turn almost. But... He wasn't even mad at Seth. He didn't. His he said he didn't hurl a bunch of insults at him, and that he understands that he's got a he's got a target on his back because he's holding the championship. Um, I, I, and, and furthermore, he goes to talk about how he's not going to give anyone an, an opportunity, but that Seth, he feels Seth is someone deserving of the belt. He's not going to make him jump through hoops. What? What? <laughs> I now I get it. McIntyre's goal is to be one of the greatest WWE champions of all time. That's what baby faces do. They send out a mission statement upon their big win. They always have to say that oh you know I've got a target on my back. I've got the belt, and I need to be a def- I need to be a fighting champion. This is the mistake they made with Seth last year. Now, Drew McIntyre is a much more likable character. He doesn't feel like he's trying to play a good guy when inside you know he's better at being a bad guy. Although I love Drew McIntyre the heel, and I think there's money there at some point in his career where they really take him on a ride. But 
for now, he's the babyface version of himself, and it's still a very good version. But last year, when Seth Rollins became that champion and started the, I'm here every week, unlike Brock, and I'm going to defend this anytime, anywhere, anybody wants to step up to the plate. It's a tired, it's a tired, tired cliche. I know that the, the, uh, the, the, the general belief is that True champions defend any time, any place. How about we worry about the respect of the championship and what the championship represents, right? Why don't we worry about that? Instead of just overshadowing it and trumping it with the thought that baby faces always have to make that statement. God almighty, they love saying the word statement and by God, this was a statement by McIntyre saying that he is going to be a fighting champion. Come on. I I don't need to hear that from Drew, who then rewards Seth's activity with what happened last week by not Seth giving the challenge, but Drew offering the challenge to Seth for the WWE Championship. This is so ass-backward. Again, this I don't think this damaged... Drew, okay, this is this is to me not a damaging thing for Drew, but it's the it, it, it's when WWE senses that they've got their top guy and then they take their filter of what they want every one of their quote top guys that the fans are behind and now we're gonna get behind them when they get behind them, they're taking this filter that is used. It's like a playbook for every babyface champion to use. And everybody, every babyface champion is taking the same play out of the same playbook. They're using the same plays out of the same playbook. And it's, make sure you say we, smile more, I'm a fighting champion, my mission statement is to be the best champion of all time. I, I, I it, Seriously, I mean, think about this. <laughs> think about it. This is not a knock on Drew who's damn brilliant. I love him as champion. Um, this is... More of a a message. God knows WWE likes to say the word message. Well, here's a message for WWE. Can you modify what a babyface champion looks and feels like? Because it feels like they're taking cues from the same coach. And they are just using a different body to say them. Like, why does somebody, whoever comes out, why do they always have to welcome you to Monday Night Raw? We know what effing show we're watching. The Authority did that week after week after week. I need, the the announcers can do it. I'm fine with the announcers doing it. Just little things like that. I don't know. Did anybody else feel that same way? Uh, And Drew is smiling in his, uh, his picture for the Money in the Bank promo for him against Seth. Drew, I don't need you smiling. What made people love you was the... The the just the kind of the sly smile, not an over you know overdone cheese type of smile that he had. It, it, I don't know. It was one of those things. I look at it. I go, what? What is this? Is Drew? Is this? Is this a senior picture in high school? I mean, that's what you smile like. And and I don't know. Um, it, it's one of those things, guys. And maybe I'm overdoing it. As some of you love to uh, say that I complain too much. No. I think you're just not, maybe not thinking about this. And if someone would like, someone would like to come on here and debate me on certain things, please, I'm begging you, please. If you have a contrary, contrary opinion or contrarian opinion, I think contrarian sounds better. I'm inviting you to come up and, and step up to the plate. And please, I'd love to have you on the show. Not kind of a, not in an adversarial type of way, but in a way that we could have intelligent, there's the key word, intelligent wrestling conversation about WWE's approach to certain things. If you're sitting here going, what is he talking about? That makes no sense. I want to come on here. It's a, well, great. Come on. I mean, the, here, here's, here's the invitation. Doors open. Uh, and I don't mean that, again, not in an adversarial type of hostile way, but I would like somebody to come on and maybe try to change my views on how WWE approaches their, their certain uh, ways. And um, I guess this is a change my mind segment for those of you that know what I'm referencing there. Um, I don't know if I just stirred up some political views, but so again, Drew's coming out and, and offering up the championship, not being mad, complimenting Seth. 
it was all ass backward. Um, but again, Drew is is greatest champion right now. It's the right thing. He feels right. It's just the content coming out of his mouth and the approach is wrong. But again, uh, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, Zelina Vega, by the way, had another all-star night. She has truly been, I think, the MVP of Raw. More than McIntyre, who's, again, that's not a slight on McIntyre as champion. He feels right as champion, as I just said. So I'm not saying she's truly more important to Raw. She just is adding that, uh, just that feeling every week of something and somebody new. She has just a nice feeling to her when you look at her. And I don't mean that in, oh my God, she's so pretty or she's hot. Uh, No, Uh, I know that she is. And she is very, very attractive, but it's not that that attracts me to her. It is her demeanor. It's her believability and it's her delivery of what she says and how she acts. That is brilliant. I've, I, you know, I continue to sing her praises and I would love her as champion someday, but her being involved with Austin theory and Andrade and, uh, angel Garza is, is right now the right call. I, I love what they're doing here with that. Um, and, and having her on commentary, she didn't hit all the notes, but she hit most of them. There were some awkward moments. And it's fine. But she doesn't get a chance to do that a lot. So I'm okay with a couple of stumbles. It's not easy. Even as a superstar wrestler on, on commentary, if you're guest commentating, usually you don't have a script. You just get on there and you just banter with the, uh, the heel and baby face announcers and you try to react to the match that's going on. So it's uh, really something that, I'm sure we'll come to her, but clearly they liked what they saw last week, the feedback they got, having her do the exact same thing this week. Not a complaint, not a complaint. It just felt like kind of the same playbook again this week, which again, it's okay. It's okay. Um, it's a safe, it's a safe, safe uh, play. Um, so we had, a, but at the beginning of the show too, beyond this, I just wanted to comment on Zelina quickly, but we had Austin Theory, Angel Garza, and Zelina interrupt. And um, Andrade attacked Drew out of nowhere, but McIntyre hit him in, with a claymore, and Garza in theory refused to uh, refuse Vega's orders and in, in order to make the save. So Mc, McIntyre stood tall again and uh, told him he's told Zelina that he's going to tear Garza apart later in the show. So uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll just move on. I'm not gonna. It's just it was just okay. I'll be, I'll leave it at that. This next segment I want to talk about. The Money in the Bank qualifier, Alistair Black versus Austin Theory. Let me just tell you this about this uh, this match. This was a pay-per-view quality match. For those of you that think I complain too much, well, here's a huge positive. I could watch these two go at go at it in a, you know, an Iron Man match. These two are uh, just and they'll continue. Hopefully they continue to work together in some kind of capacity. Alistair Black, we all know his uh, we all know his skill level. I mean, he is, I think, the best overall, overall, um, all around performer on Raw. And that's not again. I know you think I'm sliding Drew McIntyre, but he's just kind of on a. It's like apples and oranges. And uh, Alistair Black continues his rise to the top, and uh, he is facing Austin Theory. And Austin Theory is a guy that, again, you probably would have no idea who he is if you didn't watch NXT. And you come up and now this guy's making a big name for himself. It fitting in nicely with Garza and with Zelina and with Andrade. And is now being showcased against Alistair Black. They had the confidence to put them together. It was a very, very good match. Um, physical. And having... Theory take Black Mass again, man. That that how many times are they going to do that slow mo to the for the Black Mass finish? I mean, I wouldn't take that. That is, that's a very 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 razor thin margin between a small bruise and a concussion. I mean, you can't fake that. I don't know how you fake that. I just don't. It's. Brutal. The Black Mass is just, it's an awesome finish, but man, when you see that, you're like, oh, 
Right? You can't fake that for all those people that think, uh, i.e. Ronda Rousey, that's fake. So th- this one was, it was just very, very good. The knee strikes uh, with, from Black, the springboard moonsault, and the uh, bridging German suplex that followed was just, I mean, these guys worked very, very well. And it was easily the match of the night in terms of quality. And it was just, uh, this is pro wrestling, right? And, and again, again, guys, you all know how I feel about the 2020 version of pro wrestling. That is just suicide dive, moonsault, you know, 360 splashes and all that kind of stuff. Ain't my cup of tea. And it's still not. And I'm going to be sticking by my guns forever on that. But if you're going to present me with a pro wrestling match that it has evolved into what today's product is that people love, apparently, then this was your this was your pro wrestling for the night. This was your match of the night in terms of quality, in terms of chemistry, in terms of the again the right decision to have Theory lose here because he and he, I'd like to also hear him on the mic by the way, maybe hear why what he's doing, why he's here, and we haven't heard much from him. Um, so, congrats to both guys on this. This one took me into the moment and. Uh, and brought me along for the ride, as Vince would like to say. You gotta take him on a ride. Uh, well, they they did that here. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to let's see. Oh, here we go. Strap in, folks. I'm gonna take a little sip of my water. I'm gonna take a breath on this. And the next match I have: Indy Hartwell versus Shayna Baszler. As Baszler continues her her uh, resurrection from WrestleMania. That's what this is. This is really Shayna Baszler, Shayna Baszler's resurrection tour. That is what we're on. Whether we like it or not, we're on that ride right now. And last week, she apparently broke Sarah Logan's arm. And we all know Sarah Logan is not with the company anymore. So good riddance to Sarah Logan. And, um, you know, again, I hope Sarah Logan finds who she is and, and finds work. I have nothing against Sarah Logan as a person. Her character, though, was just like, what are you? Right? I mean, you guys know how I feel about it. But this week, Shayna Baszler faces Indy Hartwell. And we get the same outcome. We have Baszler do the exact same move to Hartwell, breaking her arm, apparently, and then bringing a ladder out and then kicking the ladder as her arm is clamped between the two legs of the ladder. I think that looked better than the first move. Sarah Logan did it perfectly. Uh, Indy Hartwell did not, but it's fine. I get what they're, excuse me, what they're going for. And the latter spot solidified it. That that really saved it for me. Um, it was just, it, it was brutal. And the selling and the crying by Indy Hartwell, just as Sarah Logan was crying, it was uh, well done. And I, I like what they're doing here. I could see this being spoken out when you're having the WrestleMania results um, being talked about and where they're going from there in, in a creative meeting and having them like, well, Basil's going to lose, but you know she's going to go to another level. We're going to rebuild her. She's just going to come out and just start breaking arms. Uh, you know, you, she's just going to be ruthless. And I can hear Vince. Like, that's, that's what the thought process is for Shayna Baszler's resurrection tour here after many people were very upset and disappointed over her loss at Mania. Um, I wasn't, to be honest. I, I was one that I was actually saying, I hope Becky wins, not because I like her as champion, but because I think it could be a great heel turn uh, for people just being tired of the man gimmick and tired of the arrogance and all that. But um, So we'll see about that, as we still don't know, because we have no live audience. However, uh, Shayna Baszler comes out here, and again, she looked just like a just a, a ruthless aggression uh, type of uh, reaction, and uh, no pun intended. But she was just a monster, and was just an evil sob. As I think Byron said, she was evil. That was that's a nice one. You don't hear that being used too much. You know, you hear despicable, you hear other adjectives, but to say somebody's evil, that's strong. That's strong, so I don't know if that was ad lib or uh, or planned to say, but evil's a nice description for for Shayna. It's it's perfect. She is an evil human being. Uh, so, not of course. I'm talking about the character. Okay, let's be honest. The now with all that positive that I just said, 
all of it. And people loved it. And I did too. I did too. I thought it was a great, it's a great way to rebuild Shayna. It's a great way to get her back on track and make you forget about WrestleMania and just have her come out and just start breaking people's arms and being nasty. Here's the problem, right? You have a, a stipulation or you, you have, excuse me, the lack of a stipulation or rule in place that breaking somebody's arm is not illegal. No, 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 no. It in fact will just cause your opponent to not be not able to compete, which then means that you win the match because that person can't defeat. It's essentially a forfeit. That's essentially how you're winning is by forfeit because they can't compete any longer. But yet a DQ can be caused by holding a count for longer than five seconds it can be caused by shoving a referee, just kind of even like playfully, right? It can be caused by using any foreign object in any manner. Um, it, there are so many minuscule ways to get disqualified, but breaking somebody's bones. No, nope, sorry, that's not on the checklist. No, that's not. And what made it worse is that the announcers continued to drive it home and double down. On the fact that, well, she didn't break any rules, guys. I'm sorry. You know, uh, she didn't break any rules, so uh, that's how she's winning. You know, that it's just an evil way. She's just an evil woman. Uh, how How is this even... How is this not a thing? Why would you draw attention to the fact that you can have competitors going in there <clears throat> in a, a... Just a normal, rest, sanctioned wrestling match in WWE... And have any of your competitors uh, have the free will to be able to break other, break their opponent's arm, leg, neck, and it's all legal. What? So you're saying every, essentially every match is what? A no disqualification? Right? It has to be because the only way that in a no disqualification match, the match would stop is if that person can't compete anymore or is actually injured. But what that's actually happening in a normal match, it's not a DQ. How is this not a disqualification? Somebody needs to look at the rule book here. And drawing attention to it? To advance the story? What? To me, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Because what they're trying to do is give Shayna some wins back. They're trying to give Shayna some wins back, but also they're trying to make her look like a monster. In breaking people's arms. Well, here's what they could do, Right? Here's how you fix it. You could have Shayna Baszler just mow through them, go through the match, you know, hit her finish and win clean. And then after the match, after the match, you have her break the arms of her opponents. During the match, if you're going to do it, and you're just dead set on getting that happening, that happening in the match, then it's a disqualification. Shayna loses but still she wins. If they're, they're so concerned about getting the wins in her win column back that they're really overlooking a glaring, glaring omission from the rule book and then they're drawing attention to it. I mean, I just don't get it. To me, if you're, if you're dead set on having it happen in the match, then have Shayna get DQ'd and have the announcers tell the story that, hey, Shayna doesn't care about wins and losses right now. She just wants to hurt people. Fine. I'm fine with that because we've seen that before. We've seen that story played out. It's effective. It's fine. It's basic. And I'm fine with it. And it makes sense for Shayna uh, being enraged for her loss at WrestleMania. But don't come in here and try to have your cake and eat it too. With having her win by breaking people's arms. Anybody else? Like anybody else outraged by this? Wait, what? Again, one of those points. I'm begging somebody to come on and tell me how this is okay. It makes sense. Seriously. Tell me how this makes sense. So, all right. Well, I, I think I've made my point. Let's let's move on. I wanted to get that off my system, and uh, I just really, really do. Okay. Um, and again, after my raw review, I will give you guys my thoughts on The Rock versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 37. Some of those rumors floating around. I'll give you my thoughts on that towards the end of the show. Okay. Uh, Ricochet and Alexander uh, defeated Thorn and Vink uh, again. I, I don't have a whole lot to say about this other than I think that Sh- uh, Ricochet and Cedric make a good team. 
And God knows the tag division on both brands needs some help. So I think this is a nice uh, a nice pairing. Two guys that kind of need something to do right now. And it works. And that's really all I can say about it. And uh, let, let's keep it rolling. I mean, let, let's keep it rolling. They've got a lot of potential. Okay. The next match. A qualifier match. For the Money in the Bank ladder match. Apollo Crews versus MVP. Now, MVP comes out and talks about uh, you know, for, well, first of all, well, didn't MVP retire and say that he was into managing, being you know, business associates for people now, and tried to get Drew McIntyre on his side like a month ago and got Claymore in the face? And now all of a sudden he's just wrestling again. Whatever. Um, MVP you know, had a good promo here coming out to the ring and you know, talked about how good Apollo Crews is and how talented he is. And that since he came to Raw, since Apollo came to Raw, he's been setting the place on fire. Or he's, excuse me, he's been lighting the place up. What? If you're talking about like the last two weeks, I mean, even that's a stretch. But if you look at his career on Raw as a whole, if he's talking about since he came up like from NXT as one of the first call-ups from NXT, this is a big fart. I mean, like, how can you possibly say that with a straight face? Apollo Crews has been nothing more than an enhancement talent for years. He's an afterthought. And only the last few weeks have management decided to possibly give this guy an opportunity and and have the announcer start to put him over as one of the most, one of the most talented guys on the roster. Well, if he's so talented, if he's the most, one of the most talented guys on the roster, why does he lose every week? Right? Right. Why, why is he losing every week? What you're telling me and what I'm seeing don't match. And then, you know, I, I felt it a couple of weeks ago and I go, oh, here they go. They're, you know, they're, they're going to see what they got with Cruz. And I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. But don't, you know, don't uh, put a dog in front of me and tell me it's a cat. I, I mean, just don't do that. Um, so uh, MVP came out and, and said that, <laughs> I mean, LOL. LOL to that statement. Uh, Apollo Cruz has not been lighting anything up. Um, like absolutely nothing. I mean, anyway, I'm sure there's a joke there. I just, I'm too tired to think about it. Okay. Um, but overall, this was a good match. I'm fine with it. You know, Apollo Cruz is really just known for his, his athleticism, not exactly his, you know, promos. Um, I don't know if I've ever felt a promo that Cruz has had, not that he's had that many, but, um, it was an okay match. I, you know, I didn't love it. It was okay. It was solid, but, uh, it ended with the gorilla, uh, gorilla press slam and a standing shooting star press. I don't know why I can't say that. And a power bomb for the win. So Cruz defeats MVP, and uh, Cruz is seems to be for whatever reason now on the radar of like, oh, he's you know he's a good soldier. Let's uh, let's see what we got with him. Let's give him a, a pat on the back and add a boy and give you one of the biggest matches of your career in the Money in the Bank ladder match. That's essentially what this is. And the announcers alluded to that too, that this on Raw was Cruz's biggest victory of his career. Sad. And he's been on the main roster for what, like five years, I feel like. And this was the biggest win of his career in front of nobody beating MVP. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's move on. Liv Morgan versus Ruby Riot. Hey, yeah, yeah. Okay. First of all, I will say Ruby Riot has really reinvented herself to me. She's the same person, but she's not. It's like she came back with confidence. Um, and she should be, I think, in line sometime this year for a SmackDown or a Raw Women's Championship opportunity. Doesn't mean she has to win, but she should be in the conversation at some point. Um. So Liv Morgan defeated Riot here, and I don't know why. I I, I just, I don't know why. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. And you know, had Phillips and Saxton put over her victory as a chance for her to move on from Riot and her old team. Um, but, I, I mean, really? I, I don't know. I, does anybody even care about this program anymore with the Riot Squad, the former Riot Squad? I mean, it was only, you know, Sarah Logan's fired. And you have Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot. I mean, they're, they're the mainstays. It's not exactly a very memorable group. I wouldn't even draw attention to the fact that that group existed. 
right? And now they're they're fighting over it. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Um, so <sighs> Riot is seriously criminally underrated, and I think that eventually she'll rise to the top. I don't think Liv Morgan is women's championship material. It's just a fact. Not everybody has to eventually have a chance with that belt. Not everybody has to have an opportunity at that belt. Because in most sports, there's only one championship, which means the best of the best get it. This isn't a participation award type of deal. So, um, But anyway, I think Riot has the women's championship in her future. I'll just say that. The next match, Mysterio and Murphy for a qualifying match for the uh, Money in the Bank ladder match. This was very good, too. You could you could make an argument that this may have been the match of the night. And it just shows you, you know, Mysterio was touted for having a, you know, a, a 30-year career. This guy is a, like a, seriously, he's timeless. Has he lost a little bit of speed? Yeah, but not enough for you to go, ooh, you should get out of the ring, you know? He and Murphy had a very good match. Very good, and I could use, I could do without the the phrase gutsy win, right? I don't need a gutsy anything. I mean, can we just can we just get off the banter? Please think of another adjective. Everybody has to use the same language. Everybody's like effing robots. Can we think of our own words and stop calling gutsy wins for baby faces? I mean, God Almighty, or a very game somebody. For God's sake, can we please? There are other words in the dictionary. Find them and use them. Don't be a corporate drone. Okay, there, there's my thought on that. But the match was, I love this match. Uh, this, to me, was the main event of Raw. As far as, well, you know, number one, what was on the line? You put these two on paper, there's a lot of potential there. And they lived up to it. And uh, having the 619 and the splash in the top rope and Mysterio earned the gutsy win. I'm, I'm literally reading gutsy win right now. I didn't make that up. Um, and having him in the in the Money in the Bank briefcase, I was a bit disappointed at the outcome. Not because I don't think Mysterio is deserving, but because to me it should be about showcasing some of the younger talent. And I know that Mysterio brings an infinite uh, amount more of star power than Murphy does. But the fact is that Murphy, to me, is the future of WWE. Now, is he going to be the the guy in WWE? Probably not. Probably not. And that's okay. But he could be a pop-in main event talent in and out and help other guys have great matches. There's okay, That's an okay role to have. You know, everybody doesn't need to be at the top of the food chain. That's why there's a food chain, right? That's why there are dynasties in sports. That's why in life there's a social pecking order, right? Corporations, what does it look like? Looks like a pyramid. Not everybody can be the CEO of the company. That's just the way life is. So, um, you know, to me, Murphy needed to be showcased here, and he was. He certainly had a great match, but we know he can have a great match. Now, let's give him a, a, a good win, a, you know, a meaningful win. But apparently, WWE wanted to have Mysterio's name value, name brand value, in the match to elevate the overall feeling of the match, rather than just having Murphy, who has said nothing since he came to uh, join Seth's group. And you know, where the hell is he, by the way? Right. Where is Seth's group? Are they just forgetting about it? Are they waiting till AOP comes back? I would think. I would think they're waiting till AOP gets healthy, and then they'll bring Murphy back into the fold. Maybe that's why he wasn't given a win here, so that he could be opened up to help Seth in his championship match against Drew. So, just some food for thought. I'd like to think that way anyway, but I'd like to hear from him, for God's sakes. Please, I want to hear what he has to say. And, and where did Seth's group go? There's no explanation for that. Um, so, uh, next match here. We had... What did we have? Uh, Charlotte defeated Carter. I mean, after the figure eight. I mean, I don't even know what to say about that other than Flair wins. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, that's fine with me. I think Charlotte Flair... N- I don't think she needs to win, but after her statements and her victory over Rhea Ripley, she can't be coming out here losing any matches. I mean, it's just it's just not going to happen. Right? Charlotte's just going to continue to mow people down until she gets in front of a formidable opponent that can possibly you know, go toe-to-toe with her. So, Flair wins. 
There's nothing more to say about that. Akira Tozawa versus Andrade. Uh, Andrade beat Tozawa in a very good match. We didn't get any ramen noodle uh, moonsaults. Um, for those of you that are super offended by that, I, I, I'd love to talk about why. Please tell me how that's offensive. Moving on. Um, let's see here. And then we got Drew McIntyre versus Angel Garza. Okay, I know there's a couple other things here, but uh, McIntyre beat Garza. And McIntyre then Claymore kicked the like everyone on ringside except for the announcers and Zelina Vega. I mean, I, I think in total he hit probably six Claymore kicks last night. And I am fine with McIntyre being elevated, looking like a monster. He should. He beat Brock Lesnar straight up. Um, all of that. And I'm fine with it. I'm surprised Seth didn't come out again. And Drew McIntyre did a... Uh, you know, a, a diving somersault to the outside and in and, and keeping up with 2020's style of pro wrestling that we find, quote, entertaining. Uh, McIntyre did that and then he did it very well. And then he went to Zelina and said, I can do it all. And th- that was very charming, clever and well executed, no doubt. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Right. It was like the uh, Viking Raiders coming out and doing moonsaults and stuff like flopping off the top. Why? To just keep up with what today's definition of what a wrestling match should be. I don't know. Um, so I, I don't know. I hope this was just a one-off and just kind of him in an, in an exhibition type match, just goofing around. But I hope it does. I, I just hope he doesn't add this to his normal repertoire repertoire of offense. It's not needed. That's not what Drew McIntyre is. Okay. Um, but this really was just built to make McIntyre look strong. And I guess my closing comments on raw, and then I'll get to the rumored WrestleMania 37 match is if you're going to build McIntyre up, can it not be at the expense of a group that's up and coming with Zelina Vega at the helm, please? Can it can it just be somebody else or some other group that is not an up and coming group that has the United States champion on it, and in that three of those guys can't take out one of them, but can't take out Drew? It just seems like they're sacrificing the wrong people right now. You don't do this against a group that has just newly formed and has Zelina making strides with this group. Get him the hell away from Drew. I don't want to see these three and Drew face one another ever again. They need to go off, do their own thing, have Zelina at the the forefront, be the mastermind, be the outspoken mouthpiece, and start tearing through people, tearing through teams. Maybe Angel Garza and, and Austin Theory can become... Tag team champions, take it off the Street Profits at some point. Have them all hold gold. And with Zelina just boasting about it. But for God's sakes, I don't need to see Drew destroy this team. As much as I love Drew, I don't want it at the sacrifice of three up-and-coming stars for a stable that uh, has a lot of potential with Zelina. It's it's just not the right sacrifice. I'm okay with sacrifices given against Drew, but not that sacrifice and not three sacrifices. You, you, know, you, you build them up and build them up and Zelina's talking trash... And not just once, but twice, two weeks in a row, Drew makes them all look like fools to end Raw. I mean, so, uh, I'm not a fan of it. Just because, as much as I love Drew, and we do love him as champion, it's just not the right sacrifice. So, uh, just some food there for thought again. So, okay. Let's get to the rumored WrestleMania 37 match with Roman Reigns and The Rock. Now, The Rock recently said, I think it might have been on Instagram or, or some interview he did, that he would be open to a match with Roman Reigns, given everything is right. I mean, the the story, the time and place, he didn't say it, but I'm sure, the money. (laughs) Uh, All that's true. And we have no idea when Roman Reigns is coming back, and Vince McMahon has instructed all announcers, all wrestlers, to, to not mention the name Roman Reigns. And people are going, why? Well, here's why. You don't want to mention a guy that you have no idea when he's coming back. He's coming back, but why would you mention a guy that you have no idea when he is? Because he can't be there to defend himself. He's not going to be there to defend himself. And it just makes no sense because that payoff may not come for months. So it makes sense. Erase him from your brains. So simple answer. But with The Rock versus Roman, that's an interesting dynamic. You could certainly hold that match at 37 in front of L.A. You're you're, You're in Hollywood. You know, it's basically the Rock's backyard, and I'd be interested in it. I think the quality of the match can be very good. The story can be very good. 
I just have a couple of lingering questions and concerns. That they don't turn Roman heel, which is probably a known fact. It'll just be you know, the fans turning him heel by default at Mania and booing the hell out of him. Or, oh my god, or if they turn Rock heel. God almighty, please don't. The fans will immediately hit you back hard. If, if the, if, I really believe that the fans would hit back if WWE does that. But beyond that, they probably won't turn Roman. That's my number one co- uh, concern. Number two, that Roman will probably win that match. And if he does, what do they do? Hug it out. Oh, they're family. Well, let's have a hug it out moment. And then have The Rock raise his hand and point to him. Like, I'm, you know, I am basically anointing you as the next guy. Well, let me, let me basically just light this torch and hand it to you. Right? Are we going to take the Olympic torch, hold it, have it at ringside and just... I mean, you might as well just be transparent about it if that's what you're going to do. Or at least try. I mean, the, pa- the, pa- the torch has been passed so many times to Roman Reigns... That it's not even funny anymore. And and it hasn't, I don't think, ever been effective. Never has it worked. Name the time at WrestleMania, because that's when torches get passed, that it has worked for Roman Reigns. Triple H tried it, failed. I mean, that was a big bomb of a, of a main event. Brock Lesnar. Nope, he lost to Brock at one WrestleMania, and it was a no decision in the other WrestleMania, as Seth uh, had the heist of the century, as Michael Cole famously put it. Uh, what do you have after that? Undertaker? Him being Undertaker? The fans, did you, did you hear them that night? And did you hear the next night on Raw? The most brilliant crowd in the history of crowds? Standing there and cussing at Roman Reigns for 15 minutes? And then Roman Reigns trying to act like he owned it and acting like, oh, I could have stood there forever. And, no, Roman, this is this is true hate. Okay? Okay? This is this is not us embracing you as a as a, as a as the guy. Okay? So, but the fact is, Roman Reigns has yet to have the past torch, the torch past him. I'll get the words out right. Has yet to have the torch passed to him and have him not drop the torch. It has yet to happen. So if they think the rock's going to be the the guy to do it, they have another thing coming. It's just not going to happen. So if that's the outcome where they do this program, Oh, it's a family storyline. They can draw a lot of stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then by God, they turn the rock heel or they keep Roman baby face. And then they have ultimately the Rock lose to stand there, hug it out, hold up Roman's hand, point to him as they're both sweaty and embrace, and the Rock leaves. No, stay the hell away. No, no, unless you. This is a Roman heel turn uh, story or mission. Get it out of my face. And if it is a Roman story for a heel turn, great. I am. I would sacrifice a lot for a Roman heel turn. Really. I would sacrifice a loss to the Rock at WrestleMania if it meant that the purpose was to get Roman over as a heel. If it's not, I'm going to put it down the toilet and trash it. I don't want this match to happen. Because we all know what's going to happen. So, uh, there's my thoughts on that. And Do I think it's likely? I don't think it's likely. I think it's possible. If I was going to put a percentage on it, maybe 20% chance that this happens. The Rock's not getting any younger. And WrestleMania hasn't been in L.A. since, what, WrestleMania 21, 22, something like that. So uh, if they're going to go big time, this is the time to do it. The place is right. Rock's in great shape. Roman is the centerpiece of WWE. So I think the stars have aligned for the time and place. Now it just comes to the story and cash. (laughs) So... Uh, we'll have to see on that, but uh, let me know what you guys think. Would you like to see it? If you would, why? And if you don't, why not? So hit me up on Twitter at the WWE podcast. You can also email me again, questions, comments, concerns with your voicemail. Just use your phone to send me a voicemail at real WWE podcast at gmail.com. You can also, uh, go to my website at WWE podcast.com and check out all the stuff I got there. I got lots of podcasts and you can also support the show. If you like to shop on Amazon, there's a banner that you can click on and do shopping through there. It just kicks back a little bit of a, a commission to the show so that we can basically take care of our expenses on this end as we um, want to make sure that we're here for you for the long haul. So that's it for the show tonight, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that uh, you were, I hope you were entertained 
Okay, I want to make sure I entertain you and put a smile on your face. Uh, I, I can't even say that without wanting to punch myself in the face. I mean, it's does it get any softer? Does it really? I mean, are, are we a you know the little sisters of the poor over here? Are we that soft right now that WWE's mission is to put smiles on people's faces? Like, are the talent that brainwashed? Are the talent really that brainwashed that that is truly their mission? You know, the, the human emotions range from more than just happy to entertained and smiling. You know that there are other emotions, right? And you want to kind of play on those emotions, but hey, if you're WWE, all you care about is making sure people smile. Uh, okay, all right. I'm gonna end the show before I go on a rant. Thank you guys so much for uh, for joining us as we are here almost every single day with my quick hits. And I mean, we do probably seven, eight, nine shows a week now. It's crazy. Um, and my awesome team of co-hosts will cover SmackDown. We cover every uh, NXT, AEW show. So we are here for you guys. And I'll be back personally tomorrow as we do uh, a From the Vault version of the Nostalgia Show. And uh, then we'll be back later in the week. You guys know the rest of the schedule. So thank you so much, for guys, for listening. And as always, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>